this going. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar with our fantastic partner, Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. Uh, we're pleased that you're joining us this morning. My name is Steve Van Dorn. I'm the president and CEO of the President Chamber of Commerce. Really glad you're here. I'd like to first introduce the chair of our board, Tracy Lewis Taylor, who is in my right part of my screen. So you want to wave, Tracy, or say hi? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Appreciate you joining. Yeah. Um, and I also want to introduce my staff member, Susie Weiss, who's helping behind the scenes. Good morning, Susie. Thank you. And we also have Don Wilson here. Uh, Don is uh, joining us as well. And I think I got everybody. So good. So uh, we're really excited to have uh, the present CEO of Stanford Healthcare Valley Care with us today, Rick Shumway. He, Rick's just been uh, a wonderful partner. Um, I've heard him speak several times. He's just really lays it out so us laymen like me can understand what's going on. So Rick, we're really pleased you're here with us. Um, and just give you a little bit of background about Rick. Um, he, uh, prior to coming uh, to Pleasanton, he served uh, the, as the chief administrative officer uh, for the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, a 780 bed medical center, uh, which also had a um, level one trauma center, academic medical center, and um, all, all located within the greater Cincinnati region, um, serving that whole area. Um, he also, after that, served some time uh, prior to that. He was uh, in, in Utah and worked at another hospital there and spent some time in Seattle and Washington. Rick currently resides in Danville, California with his wife, Sarah, and is the father to three active boys. Uh, curious how that's going, Rick. And uh, he loves being in California, enjoying the wonderful weather, fishing and camping whenever he can. So. Please join me in welcoming our guest today, uh, Rick Shumway, President and CEO of Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. Thank you, uh, everybody. It's good to see you, all of you um, virtually. I I, uh, I know that's only been said six billion times over the course of the last uh, year, but um, legitimately, it's it's good to be with you this morning. And um, you know, I do love uh, fishing and camping, and I'm 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 thrilled to be with all of you this morning. Uh, but uh, my boys are up at Yosemite uh, for a week-long camp today, so you know uh, this is a good a good alternative. Um, but if it weren't for the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce, I'd rather be up at Yosemite uh, today. So uh, I'm really excited uh, uh, to be able to have the conversation with you. Um, I also uh, appreciate the the continued support um, of all of you and and in, in, in our community. Uh, it's just been an unbelievable year. Um, it's been one that I, I don't think any of us really uh, sort of could have conceived of uh, at the beginning of it. And it continues to be dynamic and challenging and changing even now uh, as we're entering into a new phase uh, of, our, uh, of our pandemic response, which I'm happy to, to respond to. Um, the one thing I'll just say uh, before I get started is if you do have questions, um, you know, there will obviously be a, a period here at the end where we certainly can have as much of a dialogue about anything that you want to talk about, whether it's pandemic related or not. Um, uh, but feel free to put things in the chat uh, as well um, as, as we go. And um, we'll try and hit those either in the middle of the presentation or towards the end, uh, depending on sort of the flow. So uh, open and, and happy to have those those conversations as we go. So I, I have slides. Uh, admittedly, they're just pictures. Um, so hopefully that keeps things pretty interesting um, as I talk through some things that we've got going on here. Um, so we'll just we'll go to the first slide there, uh, Steve. So um, it has been, uh, uh, as we've said, it's been an unbelievable year, uh, but it's kind of an interesting time for, for all of us. Um, uh, here at Stanford Valley Care, you may know, maybe you don't. If you don't, we'll be communicating through the chamber very shortly. Uh, this is our 60th year uh, as a healthcare entity in our community. Um, what an amazing uh, sort of milestone, I think, for us as we look back to what has been over the course of that year, year those years. Uh, but this last year, as we've led into the 60th uh, a year of service, has been one for the record books. 
Um, I will tell you that we do intend uh, shortly to do celebrations of that 60th year uh, later in the year. We'll, we'll be communicating a lot about that. Um, but uh, what I thought I would do is I think about that kind of 60th year uh, moment um, is, is really think a little bit about uh, what we've been doing and what I'm proud of as it relates to how we've handled this pandemic uh, and some of the things that we've been able to put into place to ensure that our communities are well taken care of. And as I think about those 60 years that we've been in existence, that's really what's uh, been in place to drive us. So again, I'd be remiss if I didn't spend just a few minutes uh, sharing some things. Some of you may know some of these things, some of you may not. Uh, so forgive me if any of this is redundant, but uh, these are things that I'm really proud of uh, related to our organization and how it's responded uh, to really, again, this unprecedented year that we've, we've been in. So there are a few examples of things that I, I think would be interesting for you to know uh, about in terms of how we've responded to the pandemic uh, uniquely. Um, so let's first start with capacity. So as you think about why that's important, when we talk about things that have happened during the pandemic, whether they've been um, uh, health orders or masking requests or vaccination efforts or otherwise, um, it's really been in, a, in an attempt in many ways, obviously to ensure that the public is safe, but to preserve important hospital capacity so that if somebody truly gets ill uh, and has a significant need to be taken care of, uh, there would be a spot for them to be taken care of in. Um, COVID, as you know, uh, is, a, is an airborne transmittable disease. And so hospitals had to adapt very, very quickly when the pandemic began. I'll give you a little bit of perspective. So here at Stanford Valley Care, prior to the pandemic, uh, we had uh, about seven what we call uh, isolation rooms, inpatient isolation rooms. And these are rooms that have a special way that the air gets filtered to ensure that whatever microorganism that we're trying to keep inside the room stays inside the room and doesn't leave and go outside the room and, and potentially create problems elsewhere. Um, for an organization that our size, that's plenty. Um, that, that, that gives us the ability to take care of somebody who comes in with tuberculosis or something like that um, to ensure that we are, are protecting the patient, protecting the staff, protecting other patients, uh, visitors and otherwise. So as I said, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we had seven of those rooms. We had to very quickly change our approach because as you know, with the COVID uh, transmission, as we just talked about, it's an airborne transmittable disease. Uh, so within three weeks time, we converted 58 spaces in our organization to become isolation rooms uh, that met the standards needed to ensure that we could put infectious patients in those rooms. So we went from seven inpatient isolation rooms to 58 within three weeks, which I have to tell you, uh, had you told me that we would have to do that prior to the pandemic, I, I almost would have said that would have been impossible, um, but it wasn't and our teams really stepped up. So the good news is, is that our organization is well prepared from an isolation capacity standpoint uh, to handle any surges that come through. The other thing that was really important during the course of the pandemic is that we developed a capability to surge beyond 70% of our top capacity. That's a lot. And so when you think about what that means, that means that if the hospital beds are totally full, what do we do? We've come up with surge plans that allow us to not quite, but almost double the capacity of patients that we could take care of if every hospital bed was full. Uh, and I think that that's a really amazing thing to know it's peace of mind, I think, from a community standpoint to know that we have that capability. Uh, and it's something that we've worked really hard to ensure. Um, we've also completely adapted our IT infrastructure even beyond what it already was. Uh, as, as many of you know, and probably have experienced, we've really leveraged telemedicine over the course of the last uh, 18 months in a way that we had not even imagined or contemplated before. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an insight into that, at Stanford, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had about 5% of our overall physician visits that were occurring uh, on a, a virtual basis. Within two weeks, we went to 70% uh, telemedicine visits uh, over that period of time. So 
all of these things together really, I think, give us the perspective that, hey, we've actually done quite a bit to ensure that our capacity has expanded in a way that we can and have handled surges in COVID patients and are well prepared to handle them if they occur in the future. So I'm really proud of that. So another thing that uh, has, has uh, been a real win, I think, for our community and for our organization over this pandemic period is our capabilities. Um, so again, there were so many early news stories about ventilator shortages, equipment shortages, uh, personal protective equipment that was having to be reused by staff in hospitals all over the country. And while I will not say that it was an easy period as it relates to any of those things, what I will say is that by harnessing the power of Stanford, there was never a moment during the course of the last year that we worried about not being able to provide PPE for our staff, that we worried about not having enough ventilators or equipment to take care of our patients. Uh, we've really worked hard uh, and literally scouring the globe uh, to ensure that we have the adequate uh, uh, supply and support uh, to ensure that our teams are taken care of and our patients are taken care of. So I'm really proud of the teams for doing that. I'm also proud of the testing uh, things that happened over the course of this last year. So a few things that, that I wanted to share, and some of them you might know, uh, some of them you might not. So the first thing that you might not know is that early, early, early in the pandemic, Stanford actually developed one of the very, very first tests for COVID. And what came along with that test was a really improved turnaround time to ensure that we knew that COVID was there or COVID was not in a patient. Prior to the development of this test by Stanford, we would wait sometimes seven to 10 days for a test result, which meant that we had to isolate and manage a patient for almost a week or more before we even knew if they had COVID. Uh, that changed the game once Stanford developed the actual test. And here at Stanford Valley Care, like every other Stanford entity, we were the recipients of that test uh, earlier than anywhere else in the Bay Area, certainly, but uh, really across the country. So I'm really proud of the work that our laboratory teams uh, have done to ensure that, again, our organizations, our patients, and our communities are in the very best possible position at the earliest possible moment. So that was really a, a proud moment for our organization. Another proud moment around testing was the partnership that we had with our partners uh, in the cities of Pleasanton, of Livermore and of Dublin. And I need to just uh, shout out quickly uh, to Nelson Fialo from uh, Pleasanton, Linda Smith uh, from Dublin, and Mark Roberts from Livermore, the city managers, who really came together uh, with us to brainstorm about how we could provide better services and better access to testing early on, uh, while uh, that was still something that was uh, a question uh, about access. And so we came together pretty early on. We uh, partnered with the county. We partnered with the county fairgrounds. Uh, many of you may have experienced uh, that there at the fairgrounds to open um, really the premier testing site locally very early in the pandemic. And that was an important part of uh, the pandemic response was to ensure that people could get tested uh, when they felt like there was a potential exposure. We've also uh, worked really closely at Stanford with private industry in working on solutions for mass production of regular, more easily accessible COVID tests for staff. So again, while we were really excited to be able to provide that testing site locally, uh, you know, the accessibility of COVID tests has really improved over the course of the, the last few months. And we've been really excited about the partnership that we at Stanford have had with organizations uh, out of Silicon Valley, like uh, Color is one, uh, who actually uh, has given us the ability to easily do self-testing for our staff, uh, as well as community members in, in, in various settings. So I'm really proud of the testing response uh, that, that happened here uh, over the course of the last number of months. Um, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't say just a few words about what we've done from a vaccination standpoint. Uh, I was thinking about it the other day, and it's really incredible to think that some of the very first people on planet Earth to be able to acquire 
and administer the vaccines happened here in Pleasanton, California. Uh, we were some of the very first to receive the vaccines at Stanford uh, and moved very expeditiously in providing that opportunity to our physicians, to our staff members and team members who were on the front lines uh, in the battle against this, uh, this disease. Um, so I'm really proud of, of that timeline. I'll never forget the morning uh, of the delivery of the very first vaccine doses. We all lined the halls here at the hospital. It was almost like a red carpet moment with our pharmacists walking down the hall uh, with the box of the very first vaccines. Um, it was really kind of a striking moment, uh, really, and, and really proud of, of everybody who worked together to make that happen. I'm also really proud of the continued partnership, again, with our communities uh, to ensure that vaccinations were accessible as early as possible to our, to our community members. So many of you uh, probably experienced, uh, similar to the testing, our vaccination site at the fairgrounds, where we, again, partnered with cities, counties, the fairgrounds, and also our partners at Sutter Health uh, to provide the premier vaccination site in the region. And we literally provided hundreds of thousands of vaccination doses uh, over the course of that period of time and continue to provide vaccine doses in various ways. So also very proud of that. Uh, we've become pandemic content experts. Uh, we've learned certainly a lot, uh, but we've provided uh, all of our local communities with Stanford expert resources related to all these aspects of the pandemic. I remember talks that were given about should we clean our milk cartons uh, before we bring them home from, from uh, the, the grocery store? Uh, we've given talks on how employers should consider bringing back work, bringing people back to work and protocols, and then how the viruses and vaccines work uh, with all of our Stanford experts. So I've been really proud of that. And then last but not least, uh, health equity. We've partnered uh, with our, our partners at Access Community Health on many vaccination services and testing services, and are very proud of that. Uh, continued partnership that we have in serving uh, those populations. Uh, we partnered with the county in reserving slots for vaccinations for underserved populations, and then also with our colleagues at Stanford Children's to bring the vaccination to all of the approved ages as soon as it was available. So I would just say in a big breath, it's been unbelievable as I look back at all the things that have happened uh, to ensure that our communities were in a, a strong position uh, to respond to this pandemic. And I'm proud of all of the teams uh, for, for all of that work. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So I, I also have to say that despite the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we're really proud of the fact that we've continued to provide exceptional care, exceptional regular health care throughout the course of the pandemic period. Uh, a few things that I'll just point out uh, our leapfrog rating uh, has been very consistent. We're a leapfrog A organization, which is a quality and accountability study uh, that ranks hospitals based on a long list of, of quality outcomes. Uh, it's the highest ranking that you can get and only 33% of US hospitals achieve this leapfrog A uh, rating for quality. And we're really proud that this has been something that we've pursued and continues to be uh, a recognition that we've received. Uh, many of you know that last year we were ranked by U.S. News and World Report uh, very highly, uh, top 50 in California, uh, top uh, 10 in the Bay Area. Uh, and this year we're continuing to uh, get good recognition, particularly in a variety of our specialties that are developing, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So I'm really proud of that. And then last but not least, uh, our regulatory body that accredits us and ensures that our quality uh, is up to snuff. Uh, is the Joint Commission. For those of you who don't know what the Joint Commission is, I'm not exaggerating. There's a book about this thick that has all the rules that hospitals are supposed to follow uh, to ensure that high quality care is taken care of. And the Joint Commission comes in on a regular basis to survey us and make sure that we're being compliant with all of those things. And I will tell you, I just wanna share one comment. Uh, in the closing session, uh, I was speaking with one of our surveyors who's been a Joint Commission surveyor for uh, about 15 years. Uh, she says, I am out in a different organization every week across the United States. So I have a good body of work that I can refer to when I make this statement. And she said, every time I go into an organization, I ask myself, would I work here 
and would I receive care here? And would I let my family receive care here? And her summary to me at the end of our survey was unequivocally, I would work here, I would receive care here, and I would send my family here. And so hearing that from somebody in that position that does not have to say those things, I thought was a really good reflection, again, of the fact that, hey, yes, we've been in a pandemic. Yes, it's been unbelievably challenging and crazy and all of those things, but we are continuing to push the boundaries of providing the highest quality care uh, that you can get. And I'm really, really proud of, of, of that recognition. So I think that's been a great, a great moment. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So looking backwards, which I just have done, is certainly rewarding. Uh, but ultimately, looking forward is what keeps me going. It's what keeps me energized. And so what I want to do here toward the end of the presentation is share with you what the future looks like at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. Um, and there are a few things that I'm going to base this on. So the first one is we have over the course, even though there was a pandemic going on, uh, we completed our five-year strategic plan here at Stanford Valley Care. And the five-year strategic plan essentially encompasses three domains. So all of our strategies go towards each one of these domains. And I'm going to talk about them in a little bit of detail in just a second here. But you see them here on the slide. So our five-year strategic plan calls for three things. Number one, that we are locally Stanford. And I think that's really critical because that local element is so essential to who we are and bringing Stanford into the local nature of things is what we're trying to do. Uh, Stanford is a world-class organization and we wanna bring that world-class service and perspective here uh, to our region. So there are a lot of ways that we're doing that that I'll talk about in just a second. We also want to stay regionally connected. We will always be the local hospital for Pleasanton, for Livermore, for Dublin and others. But what I will tell you is, is that we have continued to build and grow our services in such a way that people are coming to Pleasanton to receive care from all over the place. And we intend to continue to, to build and grow that to ensure uh, that we are providing uh, literally world-class care to people from, from various regions of California uh, and we'll talk more about that in, in a second as well. And last but not least, uh, I will tell you that it has been uh, over six years now since Valley Care became part of the Stanford healthcare family. And our strategic plan calls, us, calls on us to continue to be intentionally integrated into our system. And I'll talk about why that's important for us as a community here in, in just a second. So let's go to the next slide. I'm just gonna give you some insight into what each one of these things actually might look like or do look like in our community. So locally Stanford. So a couple of things that I want to point out here. So number one, we have over the course of the last year as part of our strategic plan, really focused on introducing a clinical research arm of our organization into the community. So again, when you think about Stanford and in Stanford medicine, one of the things that they're world renowned for is pushing the boundaries of medical innovation and clinical uh, innovation. And what we've been able to do over the course of this past year is bring that into our communities. So one of the things that we've done is we have uh, built an infrastructure around clinical research, which is really exciting. Uh, and what that's meant is we have been able to bring multiple COVID trials to SHC Valley Care over the past year we are one of 54 sites in the world uh, where these clinical trials have been happening. So for example, when you think about the drug remdesivir, which is one of the primary treatments for severe COVID and admitted patients, people in our community had access to clinical trials for remdesivir prior to its final approval by the FDA. Uh, that's a really exciting thing to know that A, we're shaping the science and the, the, the protocols around treatments for something that's so important to our community and to our world, but it also means that our patients have access to things that don't exist anywhere outside of Palo Alto and maybe San Francisco. Uh, and so that's really an exciting thing. Um, we've also been able to introduce a master research agreement uh, with Stanford University to open more doors for this kind of activity in the future. Um, so I'm really excited about what this means. There's a great interest from Stanford to expand the research and development 
protocols and portfolio into our community here in Pleasanton. So I'm really, really excited about that and what it means for what people will have access to uh, here that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And I'm really, really proud of that. We're also excited about working with strategic partners locally. We have ongoing conversations uh, with colleagues at Livermore National Labs. Uh, that's a really big opportunity. Sandia as well, figuring out how locally we can partner with the ecosystem of innovation uh, to advance things that are coming out of the Tri-Valley. So I'm really, really proud of that. We're also uh, introducing a lot of clinical education programs. So we're training the next generation of physicians and providers. So we have resident rotations underway in vascular surgery, general surgery, heart surgery. We have a physician assistant training program here at Valley Care, uh, where we're contributing not only again to the immediate clinical care of patients, but the training of the next generation of, of providers uh, coming right out of Pleasanton, California, which is really exciting. Um, and we're also really trying to reach into areas where people might have an interest in considering this as a career path. Our hospitalist team at Stanford has built what we call the, the clinical academy for high school students, uh, where they spend two weeks. Uh, they're actually in the middle of it right now. Uh, and they get to, to experience the whole spectrum of what medicine might look like as a career path by interacting with faculty members in various specialties. They get to do dissections of cow hearts and they get to have uh, training around how to read uh, EKGs and all sorts of things like that. So these are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we're saying that we will be locally Stanford. Uh, and we're gonna continue to pursue these as we move forward. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we're also, as we said, uh, regionally connected. Uh, and, and what that means practically are a couple of things. Number one, it means that we are going to be able to provide Stanford level care here in our community. And I wanna share some examples of that with you that you may know about and you may not know about. So the first one I wanna share with you is our heart surgery program. So over the course of the last year, year, year or so, just a little bit over, uh, Stanford has hired two full-time preeminent heart surgeons that have relocated and moved into our community. This is their home. Uh, they live here uh, and they practice exclusively here at Stanford Valley Care. They are part of the overall ecosystem of Stanford heart surgery, which for those of you who don't know, is literally one of the highest ranked world-class programs uh, in the world. Uh, it's ranked number 10, I think, in the United States. Uh, it is famous for developing uh, the artificial heart and heart transplant and other things. It couldn't be more uh, preeminent. And here it is directly in our community. Uh, I will tell you that since we launched this part of the program, we are on track to see around a 220% increase in heart surgery here at Valley Care versus prior years. What that means is that means that there are over a hundred more people in our community that received this intervention close to home at a Stanford level. And that's really something I'm proud of. I'm gonna share something with you that I thought was really meaningful. Uh, one of the patients in our community, and I will of course keep all of this uh, um, confidential, uh, actually received care here and really benefited from the whole ecosystem of Stanford coming together to make sure that he had a, a really great, out, great outcome. I'm gonna read a note from you, uh, to you. It comes from Dr. Joseph Wu, who is the chair of cardiothoracic surgery at Stanford. He sent me a note a few months ago, and I wanna read just part of it to you. He said, Rick, he said, I wanna share a heartwarming story that highlights the vital partnership between Stanford Hospital and Stanford Valley Care. And I will refer to this patient as patient A. Patient A was at Valley Care being prepared for a coronary artery bypass graft by Dr. Jim Longoria, who's one of our Stanford surgeons here. During the weekend before his operation, he had an unexpected acute severe cardiac decompression. Dr. Longoria had already established excellent communication with Dr. John MacArthur, one of our stellar faculty and transplant surgeons, who is covering Valley Care cardiac surgery regarding those patients. Together with a highly effective Valley Care team, Dr. MacArthur smoothly and rapidly placed patient A 
on ECMO, which is a really high end uh, way to stabilize the heart that is in distress, and then brought him to Stanford Hospital. Over the next week, Dr. MacArthur successfully recovered patient A's heart, weaned him from ECMO, and then did a multi-arterial coronary artery bypass graft. Patient A is doing extraordinarily well. As I mentioned, both Dr. Longoria and Dr. Curry, who is our other surgeon here, are both also transplant surgeons and have extensive experience in saving complex patients with ECMO. That is why we do it. That is why we are regionally connected, to ensure that our communities have access to that kind of care that they could not get anywhere else. So I'm really proud of that. I'm also proud of what's going on in orthopedics. Stanford is building one of the largest, most complex and overall excellent orthopedic programs in the East Bay and the Central Valley. Uh, it's actually very similar to the flagship Stanford Ortho program uh, that's located in Redwood City. Uh, Dr. Bill Maloney, who is the chairman of orthopedics at Stanford, has recruited 10 surgeons that now call our community and our hospital home. Some of them are very well known local and regional surgeons like Drs. Aaron Saifong, Dr. Joe Donnelly, and Dr. Stephen Weiss, who are now faculty members in the department as well as other faculty recruits that he has brought forward and placed in our community. We are super excited about this because it means, again, that the level of orthopedic care in our region is rising. Uh, and we're actually in the process of building a high-end ortho surgery center on the Livermore campus. Uh, and we're really, really excited about what that means. We're also excited that we are applying or have applied to Alameda County to become an official trauma center. That is something that we believe our community needs uh, sorely. And so we are pursuing that designation with the county right now. Uh, I will tell you that there are over 600 residents per year that leave our area to receive acute trauma care. And what we're excited about is the opportunity to be considered to launch a program like this. So we're in that process right now. We anticipate the county hopefully making a decision over the coming months, uh, but we're really uh, thrilled about the, the potential that that brings for our community. And then last but not least, what it means to be regionally connected is making sure that we're taking care of people that are in acute stroke uh, moments. So our stroke program continues to be an exceptional community asset. It's been awarded the highest honor from the American Stroke American Heart Association in the first year of its performance. And we've served uh, almost 300 people since its inception. So I'm really, really uh, proud of that. But again, altogether, what that says is that we are a regionally connected health system providing services uh, that will uh, be unmatched, but also uh, accessible to a lot of people. And that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, I think this next one is my last slide, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, let me talk briefly about what it means to be intentionally integrated with Stanford. So something that is a big, big deal to us in the healthcare industry is what is called HIMSS Stage 7 uh, recognition. What this means is that we have one of the best and most technologically advanced IT systems uh, in the United States. Uh, and this is something that I'm exceptionally proud of the teams because evolving from what it was to what it is now, it's 180 degrees different. What this allows us to do is utilize analytics in a way that help us to take better care of people. And I think that this is just a great recognition of, again, what it means to be part of a big, broad Stanford infrastructure uh, that would have been very difficult for Valley Care to access on its own in the, in, the, in the past. So I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about things in the integration sector like our patient experience feedback and follow-up process. Historically at Valley Care, we had one to two people that would handle all of our patient feedback processes. Um, you can imagine that when you rely on one to two people, sometimes timing can be challenging, Sometimes communication can be challenging, but what we've been able to do is harness the full patient experience team in Palo Alto to help us manage all of the patient feedback in a way that we can act quickly uh, when we get that feedback. And so I'm really proud of, of that part of the integration. 
Last but not least, we are very integrated into the capital investment process. Many of you know that when we became part of Stanford, there was a requirement at affiliation that Stanford was supposed to invest 50 to $60 million in this health system. I'm here to tell you today that that is a small number comparative to what has been invested. We are in the hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in this system and continue to do so. Uh, we are currently engaged in the largest upgrade pro project in Stanford's healthcare Valley Care's history. We're replacing all of our imaging capabilities. Our interventional suites are being expanded. Uh, we have physical space expansions that are underway in Livermore, Pleasanton, and Dublin. Uh, and we have lots of clinical program support. Uh, our new high-tech uh, pharmacy compounding uh, function. We're doing lab expansions inside of a hospital. Uh, there's a new linear, ex linear accelerator coming at, at, at the cancer center. You can see some of the things on the slide here, our brand new MRI, our new Da Vinci surgical robot, and our new orthopedic robot. The list goes on and on and on in terms of investment that Stanford is making into our community. So I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited about what it means for all of us here in, in Pleasanton uh, and in the region. So in summary, again, we're certainly proud of the things that we've done over the course of the pandemic. Of course, it's not over. We're continuing to monitor carefully what's going on with the Delta variant. Happy to answer questions about that if you have them. Uh, but I will tell you that um, the future is exceptionally bright. I think that's my last slide. Uh, is just to say we're really excited about what's coming, what is here, and what's being developed here in our community uh, at our organization. So appreciate all of the great support that we always feel uh, from the Pleasanton Chamber, from the business community, uh, and from uh, the community at large, and uh, are, are literally honored to continue to be able to serve you in any way that we can. So I'm going to stop there and happy to answer questions. Uh, I know there looks like there are probably a couple of that have come through chat, but I'll turn it back over to Steve to, to moderate those, uh, those questions. How do, how do you want to move forward on those? Yes, thank you, uh, Rick. Uh, as always, you're so articulate and uh, just love your presentation and update. Uh, we are so fortunate to have Stanford Healthcare Valley Care in our community. Um, and, to, and to hear that number, over 100 million in investments uh, is just uh, amazing. Um, so uh, hundreds with an S. Hundreds, hundreds, uh, yeah. So uh, make sure I get that right. Uh, so that's excellent. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, again, if you, if you want to just uh, talk about your question, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, the first one came in uh, from uh, I hope I have this right, Yaya. Uh, thank you for your information about your I'm a clinical engineer and CEO of Advantage Biomedical Services located in Pleasanton. I would like to know how my company can support your hospital with health technology management services. So, you know, I think our, our IT infrastructure, our, um, uh, our technology and data solutions teams are the ones who primarily manage that. Um, but you have a, a good contact in, in Tracy Lewis Taylor. I hate to put her on the spot, but as your as your board chair who oversees our IT services. And so if you have questions about that, I'd encourage you to reach out directly to Tracy and uh, you know she can she can make the appropriate connections as as needed. So but do appreciate uh, that uh, support. Great. Um... Uh, Janine Rubino Brown, thank you for this informative presentation. I've noticed that the local cardiologists are part of Valley Care Physicians Associates. Does that mean they are not Stanford physicians? My father sees a Stanford cardiologist in Walnut Creek that is a Stanford physician. My husband sees a cardiologist at Valley Care. He is not a Stanford physician. Trying to understand the difference, if there is one. Thank you. Great, great question. Um, so Stanford Medicine has a variety of, of entities within it. One of the entities within Stanford Medicine is called UHA, uh, University uh, Health System Associates. Um, this is the medical foundation uh, for Stanford in the community. So what this means is that these, the, the, your, your questions are good ones. 
they are, they are Stanford physicians. Um, they belong to a medical group that is part of a foundation that is associated with Stanford. Um, and so uh, our UHA physicians or your, um, uh, our VCPA physicians, the ones that you identify there, our UHA cardiologists, they are all part of a large ecosystem of Stanford physicians. So for example, let's use cardiology as a, as a case in point. So we have what are called service lines. So we have a cardiovascular health service line at Stanford broadly. That cardiovascular health uh, service line includes everything from cardiac surgery to cardiology, vascular surgery, electrophysiology, um, and so on. Uh, and so it's really a, a comprehensive approach to cardiovascular health across the enterprise. And that means across the network. So all of these physicians and all of these entities belong to this cardiovascular service line. So you might have a UHA cardiologist, somebody that you see here at, at Stanford Valley Care, uh, and a Stanford faculty cardiologist working closely together uh, to manage patients across a broad continuum. So it's a little bit confusing as it's public facing. The short answer is yes, they are Stanford physicians. Yes, they work very closely together. Yes, there are direct connection points to all of the parts of the Stanford system that are needed uh, to take care of patients. So again, if you have a cardiologist here at Valley Care that has a, a, a complex issue that really is only treated at Stanford, uh, the good news is, is there's a direct line there, there are relationships there. And so those patient connections happen pretty seamlessly. So uh, that's a really great question. Um, hopefully that, that answers it a little bit. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Great question. Thanks, Rick. Um, well, it looks like we're getting some uh, members that want to become more of your partners here. Another question from Sam Patel. I'm a business owner and want to know who I would reach out to for families of patients who have overnight lodging needs. My property is just down the street from the hospital. So that's something that we'll continue to, to evaluate, um, particularly as patients come from further away. So our, our primary service area right now, I would consider to be the Tri-Valley, right? So San Ramon, Danville, Pleasanton, Livermore, Dublin. Um, our secondary service area really reaches as far as uh, beyond Stockton, uh, down past Turlock, uh, certainly the whole East Bay. Uh, and so that's, that's also a region where we are seeing patients uh, coming uh, pretty regularly from those areas to seek these Stanford level services. But we're also seeing patients even come from further away, uh, from Shasta. We've had patients come from Southern Oregon. Uh, we have hospitals that transfer patients that need a higher level of care directly to us like they would to Palo Alto. Uh, and so patients are certainly starting to come from further and further away. So as we continue to uh, evaluate that and, and identify those needs, we'll certainly uh, be happy to, to be in touch about those, those kinds of opportunities. Great. Um, looks like uh, Yaya uh, clarified he's looking for the contact for biomedical engineering services at your hospital. And Tracy uh, looks like she responds to that. So uh, Tracy looks like your person you want to reach out to. And she listed her uh, email in, uh, earlier in the chat. So um, I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. So uh, any other questions? I, I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, anybody want to speak up? Uh, any questions? Well, I, I, you know, we were talking about this before we started and uh, Rick was kind enough to just give us an update on I don't know about you, but this Delta variant is certainly something that's on the top of a lot of people's minds. So Rick, maybe you could just cover uh, what you already told us earlier, if you wouldn't mind uh, where things stand with the send back to the hospital and what you see coming uh, forward. We'll see if I say the same thing the second time, you'll have to keep me honest. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, a couple of things I think to, to keep in mind uh, related to this and what I actually showed uh, Steve at the beginning when we were preparing, if you literally, if you just Google 
um, California COVID cases, Google brings up a, a, a chart that you can filter and you can say what's happening in Alameda County, what's happening in Contra Costa and so on. And so that gives you a pretty good sense for sort of what's happening with the case rates. Um, what I will tell you are a couple of things uh, broadly. So the case rates are ticking up, um, no, no, no doubt about that. We're certainly, we're certainly seeing some, some increase in the case rates, uh, both in Alameda and in Contra Costa County. The good news, if you're looking at the other pieces of the data, is that the death rates, the mortality rates are still exceptionally low. So what that says is the vaccines are working pretty well, right? They're, they're pretty, pretty effective. And so uh, the encouragement that we're continuing to provide to anybody who, who wants to hear is, is to get vaccinated because what we're finding, even with uh, cases that are breakthrough cases that you hear about in the news, of severity of the disease is much, uh, seems to be much less pronounced in, uh, in uh, vaccinated individuals. Uh, and so um, when, you, when you really kind of boil it down, of uh, severity of the disease that we're seeing in the hospitals uh, and the mortality that still exists really is, is primarily around uh, individuals who are not vaccinated. And so that's really a, a key part of the data set uh, that, that, we would, uh, that we would point out. Um, I will go all the way back to the beginning of my, my, my comments today. When you look at what the hospital is capable of, we are not in extremis uh, right now. Uh, we, we certainly have seen uh, a little bit of an uptick in terms of uh, admissions for COVID patients. Uh, certainly nothing like what we saw in the, in the fall and in the winter and early spring, uh, but it is starting to, to tick up uh, uh, notably. And so I think that's something that we're, we're certainly keeping an eye on. But again, we're well prepared uh, from a surge perspective in the case that we uh, need to surge. Uh, and they're not anywhere close to activating our, our surge plan. So that's, that's good news. Um, so again, I think the message is um, in terms of the Delta variant itself, it, it seems to be more transmittable. Uh, and so that's really the, uh, the name of the game is to, to figure out how we can continue to encourage vaccinations uh, amongst those that, that have, have decided not to and provide information and, and otherwise that will assist in that decision-making. Uh, but that's the key, uh, I think, is, is, is try and get vaccinated as much as you can uh, so, that, uh, so that we can avoid you know, a, a, another you know, significant spike like we saw in the winter. And, and again, hopefully, uh, given that the Bay Area has is, is, is got a pretty high uptake from a vaccination standpoint, we don't see what we saw in the fall. Um, but uh, I think that's the thing we've learned about this pandemic is uh, just when we think we, we know something about it, uh, it changes. And so, you know, you figure out your, your very best pathway forward and you stick with that uh, until something changes. And the very best pathway forward is, is vaccinations uh, at this point in time. So that's, that would be my broad sort of overview of what's going on uh, from a Delta variant standpoint. And Rick, just to confirm, uh, since you've closed uh, the, the fairgrounds vaccination area, if someone does still hasn't been vaccinated, wants to be, someone that may feel they need to be tested, where do they go when it relates to your hospital? Maybe you can just remind yep. people. Great question. Uh, Tracy, do you want to give a quick summary? I would love to, and um, since I'm not good at multitasking, I'll ask uh, Denise or Shelby to copy the link uh, right into the chat for the group's um, reference as well. Uh, but we do continue to offer free vaccinations, <clears throat> excuse me, through our two urgent care locations. We have a location in Dublin as well as Livermore, um, and we do offer um, uh, all three vaccines available at that site. Uh, Monday through Sunday, uh, generally speaking, hours of operation, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. But there's more information on the website uh, that will point to um, uh, specific uh, days and times for vaccine appointments, as well as links to go ahead and, uh, and make an appointment directly. We do offer walk-in appointments as well for that, for that first dose. 
So I will also say we are agnostic as it relates to where you get vaccinated. So we are happy to serve you in any of those locations and, and provide that service. If that's not convenient or if CVS is closer to your house or whatever it is, uh, our message is, is we want you to seek it wherever it's most convenient and, and, uh, and to get it. So I, I, again, this is we will continue to provide those services. Um, but we want to make sure that, that people know that there are lots of places to get it. The county has a, a on their county's website, there's a list of, of places that you can get vaccinated if this doesn't work for you. Right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say, Rick, as we close things out? Thank you so much uh, for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I think there was just one more, uh, Steve, I just saw pop up. Do we have traveling doctors or nurses? Oh, yeah, yeah. Special procedures who come from out of the area. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we we bring uh, Stanford faculty uh, to our organization fairly regularly uh, for procedures that uh, may require a little more uh, complexity. Um, and uh, so that's actually been a great great partnership as well. Uh, in addition to the Stanford faculty and other physicians that are here. Um, uh, at, at Valley Care, uh, we, we do certainly receive support for those uh, more complex uh, special procedures um, here locally, but, but again, uh, make sure that they're connected to, to Palo Alto as well. So again, I'll, I'll take the opportunity, uh, Steve, just to again, thank you, thank the, the chamber uh, again for all that you're doing. Um, as dynamic and challenging as it's been for hospitals and healthcare systems, it's been equally dynamic and challenging for the business community at large, uh, and I know continues to be so. So uh, you have our, uh, our solidarity uh, and our, our support, um, and we'll continue to, to be happy to support you however we can as we go forward. So thanks for all you are doing uh, for our communities as well. Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will post this recording on our website. So. And I know Susie will include it in future uh, emails that we send out so you can share with your friends. Uh, very well done and uh, always walk away with new information, Rick. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day.